So my name is Yvonne. I'm a security analyst at Adobe, and I'm currently also a tech lead within the detection engineering focus group. And today I'm going to be going over the uh, presentation about detection engineering, just kind of breaking that down, um, looking over the life cycle, and then how to take an idea uh, for detection or alert, and then take it into an action. Here's the agenda. So we're, we'll do an intro and kind of do a high-level overview of what detection in engineering actually is. Um, we'll go over the life cycle and do a little visualization, high-level overview of that as well, um, and then break that down later on as well with steps. Uh, and then we'll apply those practical steps into an example, and then we'll review something ex exciting and has come out in the last couple of years, which is called Detection as Code. Uh, and then finally, we'll close with closing thoughts and questions. Okay, so what is detection engineering? Um, somebody asked me this yesterday when I was telling about the presentation I'm doing, and in my head it always seems really straightforward, um, but I realized later after that question that maybe it's not as straightforward as I thought. So um, a very basic explanation is transforming threat information into actionable detections. So taking different um, sources, whether it's internal, like doing research within your team, or external from a variety of different teams. So some examples are like your IR teams, um, post-incident analysis and val valuable insights from those teams uh, from different like attack vectors that they're seeing after their analysis and response phases. Um, those can help refine, refine detection rules. Uh, the, di the digital forensics teams, um, so during their analysis, uh, you know, if they have a compromised host and they're doing uh, forensics on that host, they can find all sorts of different artifacts and things that can help in creating alerts. Uh, threat hunting, this one's pretty straightforward. So when they're doing threat hunting on your environment, taking all sorts of different searches, um, those searches that they're performing and the results from those searches can also be used in building detections. Then you have malware analysis um, as well as threat intelligence. So all of these are some examples that go into detection engineering. Um, and essentially, detection engineering just allows you to uh, take all this data, all this threat information, and build actionable detections from them. And it's constantly changing. So, you know, some of these teams are relatively new. Um, they haven't been around for, you know, as long as we've had um, alert building. These teams have kind of evolved over time. So as we build new teams, um, you know, we have generative AI in the last year or so. Wouldn't be surprising if, like, the next year or two, we'll have, like, specific teams just on that department. Um, the definition in, in things involved with det detection engineering also change. So let's go over the life cycle. Um, this is by no means doctrine, and every team can do this in their own way. This is just kind of an example that I've seen um, similar across a few different teams as, as well as um, what we use. So you start with an idea. Um, like I mentioned earlier, this can be something internal, like your team's doing research, they're reading different articles, bulletins, and you figure out something that you want to build an alert on, right? Um, you can also use like intake forms. So this is like a formal approach where you have like a place where you're hosting an intake form and your, your SOC analysts or external teams can take that in, intake form and basically submit uh, an idea for a detection that they'd like to see. Or you can do collaboration. So you can take information from those previous teams that I mentioned, um, take their data and you know, collaborate with them. So we can take a lot of this different um, information that's coming in from our various teams within our security org and build security alerting from it. What we'll want to do next is validate the idea. So we'll want to check for any dependencies. So things like different log sources, um, tools that you need to be installed on hosts, things like that. Uh, we want to make a proof of concept. So essentially build test searches, um, validate that the idea works within our environment. And then we want to do testing and more experimentation. So we want to maybe generate some uh, simulated adversary activity, or maybe if you've had an incident in the past, hopefully not, but if you've had an incident in your environment for this uh, detection idea, you can take those logs and basically test your search against those logs. And then following the validation of the idea, we want to curate that uh, detection. So what curation means is basically just taking that idea, that that very raw search and enriching it, um, modifying it basically and making it more mature and more ready for production. So data enrichment involves things like adding different 
um, lookups or uh, additional data essentially to the results of the search that'll help analysts triage it or you know, your stakeholders be able to review the results of the search and be able to know what to do next and what actually happened with when it caught the results that you're looking for. And we want to optimize it and tune it. So without optimization and tuning, um, you might send your search into you know, your production environment um, and it may like explode at some point, make a lot of people mad. So we want to optimize and tune that search, um, reduce any false positives while we can, uh, maybe let it run for a certain period of time um, and verify that it's tuned enough to the point where it's ready for other people to see the results of the search. And then optimization involves things like um, looking at maybe costly commands that are running in the search that you're running. Um, we want to look at different, uh, the order of different commands that you're using. Um, let's just basically reduce the overall overhead and make the search more efficient. And the last thing is we want to standardize it in curation. So. Um, this is very dependent on your team, right? So we, you might adhere to different organizational standards. Um, you might apply you know, something like the MITRE attack framework to your searches. Um, so at this point, you want to uh, look at what standards your team is using, whether it's different, um, you know, different field names that you're using to stay compliant with your standards, or apply a framework to your search and tag it with that framework. And the last part, not the last part, but the part that before it goes into production is deployment. So at this point, you want to do peer review and automation. So uh, with peer review, you're giving it to somebody else to review it. Um, and I have automation there is because uh, later on, we'll talk about this more. But you can automate this process a little bit where uh, your search is going through a phase of testing where it's running all sorts of automated tests against the search. Um, this is kind of grabbing low hanging fruit that may, you know, issues with your search that may be easily caught with automation and doesn't necessarily need human intervention. And that'll also help reduce the overhead with the peer review process. You want to document that search. So, um, you know, for example, if you have a search that came up with internally and you have external stakeholders, we want to have good documentation for that search um, to ensure that when they're uh, reviewing the results of that search, they understand what actually happened um, and they're, uh, you know, not lost when they see the results. And then training, you know, this is as necessary, but you know, some things might be more complicated. Um, the different concepts with your searches might be more um, technical, so it might be good to, to host like a training within your team to show them um, what the search is doing and how to triage that search. Last phase here is maintenance. So after we deploy to production with our searches, we want to continue to audit those searches and ensure that they're properly running over time. Um, this could be something like quarterly reviews on the searches or you know, as often as you can maintain. Um, but we want to ensure that we have some kind of um, monitoring for their health as well. So uh, this can also be like an automated test where you're running uh, scheduled tasks against your searches to check for things like extended, li uh, extended run times or uh, the searches are erroring out occasionally. So these are things that um, you can alert to your team and then they can jump in and, and troubleshoot and see what's going on. Otherwise, that search will kind of fly under the radar. Um, it'll never create an alert and you'll never really see anything come to fruition with it. Um, and that's really uh, you know, a poor way to go about it. So we want to ensure that we con consistently review our searches and their health. Um, metrics, metrics is important as well. This is basically just ensuring that you have a way to um, check for you know, success stories with, within your searches. We want to see what the false positive rates are. Um, this is a good way to uh, report up to management with see, to see how well your detection coverage is doing. So um, you know, a good dashboard or um, occasional searches to generate metrics with your detection um, libraries is a good, good thing as well with maintenance. So that's a good little high level overview of uh, detection engineering lifecycle. Now we're gonna apply that to like a, pra a practical example. Um, so we'll start out with an idea, right? So let's say we had a detection idea for a low bin um, reaching out uh, to the internet. Let's say like there was, um, you know, like it's, it's uh, um, well let's say, let's say we had a low bin that was uh, like cert util that's performing process execution, for example. Um, we have an article that we read that maybe we saw this uh, low bin is more popular within a certain adversary, and the article also contains indicators of compromise, um, so things that we could see on the host that indicate that this adversary is using this low bin. Um, 
And then we see like tactic techniques and procedures that the adversary is also using. So we have all this data, right? And we want to take this idea with this data and then translate it into an actionable alert. So we're going to start by validating that idea. So do we have the tools to make an alert out of this? So do we have win event logs? Do we have uh, EDR installed on the endpoints that generate the logs to be able to see and have an insight into these hosts that are potentially having these um, uh, adversarial indicators? We want to test some queries against that data. So um, we'll you know, draft a, a base query. Um, we'll get some results going. And then um, we can start drafting a proof of concept using those results. Um, and again, this is easier when you have simulated data or real, real world IOCs that we can test against um, that'll help you know, ensure that the search is going to generate the detections when we need them. And then we're going to curate that. So at this point, we're going to add lookups, macros, standardized fields, uh, et cetera. So these are very dependent on your environment um, and your standards within your team. Uh, we're going to optimize any cost of the operators. We're going to adjust the scheduling. Uh, so basically set up the search to get it prepped uh, to be running on a schedule within our environment. And then we're going to tune. So again, we don't want to uh, you know, explode the queue if you do have like a SOC. Um, uh, we want to ensure that they you know, have higher fidelity searches and they're not just triaging a constant flow of noise. We want to make sure that those searches are high fidelity. Um, and then we want to apply MITRE tacking. Again, this is an example of what this process look like. You might not use MITRE in your, in your environment, but um, let's say you did. You want to apply where within that MITRE framework or where the, within that attack chain, for example, that search falls under to see what coverage you have over time. And then we want to deploy that search. So we want to document, attach any necessary training, um, and send it to the QA process. So this is going to be like peer review or maybe some automation if you have that. Um, and then following that QA process and a successful review, we deploy it to our environment. And then after it's deployed to our environment, along with all of our other library of searches, uh, we want to continue to maintain those. So we're going to monitor them for issues. Like I mentioned earlier, we can have some kind of scheduled job that runs against our searches to see um, and catch any potential issues that are happening repeatedly. Uh, we want to include them in our metrics. Um, to report, you know, different coverage, what our uh, false positive, true positive rates are. Um, we want to audit, make it, maybe do like a periodic audit that covers all of our environment and see um, we are, where we're standing as a whole. All right, so just to kind of summarize this and um, what detection engineering takes and then what is output from this process. So typically in the input, including with these, we have... Um, you know, internal research that also generates um, different detection ideas, but all these different teams provide content that we can build off of. Um, and, and then those also help contribute to the organization's security posture. So we take all that content, we apply detection engineering and this process to it, um, and then that is essentially uh, refining, adjusting, and improving uh, the inputs from these different teams. Um, and then we take that raw data and insight and we're transforming these into actionable security measures. So once this process is complete, um, typically we see an output. Uh, these are you know, the things that we can uh, promote that detection engineering provides, uh, dynamic TTP coverage. So uh, you know, threat and adversaries are constantly changing, changing their TTPs um, with uh, taking advantage with these different teams and internal research, we're providing a service such as that is dynamic and we're constantly um, staying on top of different TTPs. Um, we're reducing the dwell time. So dwell time is how long an adversary is in your environment before they're uh, detected. Um, so with an active process that's repeatable, um, we're re reducing that dwell time and hopefully sending alerts to our production queue faster um, and catching uh, adversaries in our environment before, um, well, I mean, as soon as possible, right? That's the goal. Tailored alerting. So uh, this is a big one. A lot of the out-of-the-box alerts that we see with our sims, um, you know, Elastic has a bunch that comes with that product. Um, I think Splunk does as well. So ES, like the ESCU stuff. Um, a lot of that is, uh, it's very cookie cutter and it's not tailored to your environment. So um, if you just take that alert and throw it in your production, um, it's going to it's most of the time it's not going to work very well. Um, it's either going to be very loud or noisy or it's not going to catch anything at all. So by, by taking all of this data and running it through um, 
your actual logs in your environment, we're tailoring those alerts to um, fit better to what actually is seen within your logs. And then we're doing streamlined content development. So um, a lot of this is usually very uh, static and um, uh, it's very uh, ad hoc. So everyone's kind of got their own process, they're doing it their own way. But if you're implementing a very consistent, repeatable process, it kind of streamlines it and ensures things are consistent. Um, and then really to summarize all of this, is it's a force multiplier. So um, the overall benefit of detection engineering is enhancing and amplifying the efforts of all of these teams by taking the information um, that they output and building actionable alerting off of it. So hopefully that gives you a good overview of what detection engineering, engineering is and a good process to follow when you're building alerting. Um, so detection as code is something that has been on the radar in the last um, like two to three years is where I've seen it. And it's very exciting, honestly. It's, it's something that has um, piqued my interest to implement and it's something that I'd wanna share uh, to help other people also maybe uh, want to implement this into their environment. So basically what we're doing with Detection as Code is we're applying software devel development principles to the detection engineering process. So what that means is um, when you think about it, software engineers, when they're building a, uh, a product, they're taking different modules, functions, um, bundles of code, and then that makes an overall application, right? So with detection engineering, um, uh, how that compares is we're taking a variety of different searches, um, layered in different uh, sections of like the attack chain and we're bundling those together and that together is our detection framework. That's our detection coverage for the organization. So when we want to apply the software development principles to it, um, we want to use the same tools and same methodology that software engineers use. So things like version control. So GitHub and GitLab, you can use those for a living storage place for your detection logic and components. So you're building your searches and then you're, you're saving them and storing them in things like GitHub. And that's gonna provide version control, a way to keep track of who's making what change, um, be, being able to revert and see changes historically, things like that. Uh, a CI-CD pipeline. So CI-CD is continuous integration, continuous deployment. Um, essentially, it's a pipeline you can use to send your content development through a various uh, series of uh, automated tasks, like I mentioned earlier, to help uh, save time and overhead from that manual review process. Um, so, you know, this is kind of, um, uh, you can do what you will here. Some people may just implement a very manual process, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, the world is your oyster at, at, at this point because you can automate as much as you want. Um, you can have a whole automated process for uh, testing your search against like simulated adversarial activity. And then at the end of the pipeline, you'll know that for sure your search is working and it's ready to deploy to production without issues. And then you need a sim, right? You need a, a product to run your searches on top of on, in a scheduled manner to search against your logs. So some examples are like Splunky S, um, Graylog, Elastic Logarithm. There's a lot of different products. Um, Panther Labs actually has a product that uh, implements detection as code, I think, as a default, which is really interesting. Um, so they're taking a, an approach where they, they're a sim, but they're taking detection as code and applying that default onto the sim. So uh, really the summary here is detection as code provides a vari a various benefits. Um, um, so we're wanting to ensure a few different things. We wanted to do consistent work. So um, we want a repeatable process, just like that process I mentioned earlier. Um, we want to uh, ensure things are reliable. So we're doing the same process over and over again against the searches. We're ensuring that um, the researchers, when they're exiting the peer review process or that automated process, that they're reliable when they're in production. And, you know, sister with that, we have quality of the searches. So if we have an automated repeatable process, the quality of the searches should also improve because we're not doing things manually every time. Um, uh, we have as much uh, of a standardized approach as possible. And then this also is going to make things more scalable. So if, you're, if you've made an alert before, you know how much manual processes there are involved with that. Um, there's different components within the search. There's different testing, like I mentioned earlier. Um, if you can 
implement detection as code properly, uh, in theory, it should make things a lot more scalable. So you can do more with less, right? Um, you could do more engineering work instead of a lot of this more manual, um, just inputting field, uh, values into fields on a GUI. And this is an example. Um, so credit to, there's an RSA conference um, where the Splunk research team presented on detection as code. Um, this is an example that they provided of what this process would look like with detection as code implemented. Um, so uh, here we can see that their first, their initial step is committing uh, that detection code to their repository. So that's gonna be to your version control uh, system. Um, you're converting that detection then into a, um, different format, which is typically something like YAML, or uh, there's like Sigma rules are out there and pretty popular as well. Um, but this is a format that's essentially used to organize the search in a structured manner. So it's, it's just a stru structured data format. You can think of it similar to like JSON, um, where they have key value pairs. And uh, this is gonna make it so it's um, platform agnostic. So you can have a search that's in Splunk that's got all of its fields, and those same fields translate over to um, you know, Panther Labs product. And you can use those same fields between the two platforms and push out the search to both without having to have proprietary fields in either. Um, and then we're gonna convert and test that search as well. So after we've converted it, we wanna test it. Um, we have that automated process with our CI CD pipeline. Um, and then once that's tested, we, want, we get a notification of the build outcome. Um, and then finally, if the, the tests are successful, we deploy that rule into production. So some final thoughts. Um, so tra traditional, uh, the, the traditional approach versus detection as code and modern detection engineering. Uh, historically, the process, and I kind of touched on this, this is, it's very static, um, it's very cumbersome. So as things are evolving, we're trying to make more room for detection um, uh, content development, but we still have limited amount of, uh, of people on our teams, right? So we want to automate as much as possible. We want to streamline the process, make it more efficient. Um, so these new, new concepts are helping that happen. Uh, we have, historically, we also have like siloed teams. So all these teams I mentioned in the first slide, you know, your threat hunting, um, red team, threat intelligence, uh, malware analysis, all these different teams, these different components of security, they've been siloed. Um, you know, you don't communicate very well with them and they don't really give you their data output. So if you can create communication streams between these different teams, um, you will see how much more data you can gather and how many more detection ideas you start generating. And then um, crossing collaboration also allows for faster iteration and a more co comprehensive cover coverage because you're getting all these new detection ideas, they're going through this process. Um, eventually, you're start, you're start, you'll start seeing that you'll have a variety of um, different detections across the attack chain and your, your, li your library will start expanding uh, exponentially. And then the influence of AI and machine learning. So this has been a big boom in the last year, as we've all seen. Um, you know, over time this is gonna mature and then we'll start seeing more and more application to security and detection engineering. So, you know, eventually we'll start seeing uh, ways to identify patterns and anomalies in vast data sets. Um, you know, things where we have vast uh, data lakes with all sorts of different data um, and we can apply AI and ML to that data and essentially uh, capture things that aren't usually seen for different um, resources and then alert when we have an anomaly on that resource. So instead of like the traditional, we're just looking for a specific thing that's happening at a certain time on a certain resource, we're looking for anomalies across a vast data set. Um, and that's you know, made possible with AI and ML. Um, and then eventually we'll also improve the curation process. We'll have smarter detections. Um, it'll be awesome you know, to have a function with like you know, chat GPT, open AI, any of these where um, we can apply their uh, computing power and their processing power and, and be able to read our searches and our library to um, detect our issues rather than having to build um, these automation workflows to, to do that ourselves. Um, so the AI and ML might do a better job, be a little bit smarter in detecting things that are, you know, for example, optimization issues or issues with your search that you might, may have not caught with your own automation framework. All right, and that's all I had. Um, at this point, we can ask questions. I think we've got a couple of minutes at least, so, yeah. What would be your response to someone who says all this is redundant if you 
have like an EDR, XDR for host, and a next gen firewall for, for your network detection. That they already have their best black box of detection. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we see like a lot of managed XDR, like things like that, where that's what he's saying. Like he can pull a bunch of this data into managed services, and then they can, um, in theory, they'll build alerting off of all these different sources. Um, so the benefit you get with like a, an, an internal team that's doing it um, and doing this process on their own versus like an XDR product um, is that you can essentially take all this data and correlate correlate it with each other, um, and have that internal company knowledge of like what resources. Uh, you need to monitor for and what looks bad. So really, you're able to create a better threat landscape um, for your detection library and better apply um, uh, detections for that threat landscape because you have that knowledge of your environment. Um, that's really the biggest benefit, I think. Um, but also, really, you're having a more integral, integral process. You're more intimate with what your detections look like. Um, I think with a lot of the XDR stuff, it's it's like I mentioned earlier, it's a lot of the cookie cutter stuff. So what they produce may not be um, as optimized and, and work as well in different environments. Yep. So uh, you said you mentioned like having to simulate data to validate detections. How do you kind of validate that you're actually simulating? Yeah, so um, usually with, with your detection ideas, you, you start out with, uh, with like, you, you have the, uh, the resource where you know what the bad stuff looks like, right? So you have like an article that, like I mentioned earlier, for a, a binary that's doing something that's not supposed to be doing. So you know what you need to simulate, and then at that point it's a matter of, um, you know, either getting a, an external team, like if you have a red team or a, you know, a team that's responsible for uh, generating bad activity for your logs, um, or you can do it exter internally as well, right? So if you have the resources, you can um, look at this article or this um, uh, security information that you have and then replicate it within your environment to generate the logs. And then at that point, you have the logs, and then you could build a search, and you'll have these logs of that simulated adversarial activity to test against. Um, but yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll require knowledge, right, of like how to simulate that activity. Um, and I mean, that's a capability that's kind of necessary, I guess, to make sure and be sure that, um, that you are properly emulating it, right? But if you don't know how to do it for sure, then um, it, it won't be, you know, as reliable, I guess, so. All right. I think we're good. Yeah, we'll, I think we're out right on time as well. So thanks for showing up, guys. Appreciate it.